All right, pros and cons of starting in May. So we're just gonna hit the pros and I've got it in a couple of different categories. This first one has to do with navigation. Starting late, you can have more dry trail. So navigation is pretty easy. You can see the trail. It's gonna correspond with your guidebook and your GPS and your, and your topo maps and all that kind of stuff. Uh, whereas earlier, starting earlier, you're gonna have more of the trail covered in snow. When you can't see the trail, People do question it and feel insecure and sometimes get lost and that kind of stuff. So starting later, a navigation is easy. Places in Southern California yet may still have snow, but it would have to be after a heavy winter and it would have to be after a winter where storms tracked more southerly. Um, Southern California does have ski areas, believe it or not. Um, and you'll pass by a few, but um, if they, have a, if they have a good enough snowpack to where they can open up and, and carry on for, for a while, um, that's, that's not that common. It uh, used to be more common, but it isn't that much anymore. Uh, right, like right now, they've got about 30 inches of snow, whereas I think Mammoth, is, Mammoth Lakes uh, up in the Sierra, uh, just south of Yosemite, I think has maybe uh, 15 feet, 20 feet, whatever it is that they've got. They usually have the most. So that's in terms of navigation. Starting late, navigation's early. I mean, easy. Logistically, starting late. I call May late uh, because it's so damn hot. It's not the best time to start. We've had people die uh, in Southern California because it gets too hot. And people think, well, there's trees. So I take shade, you know, find some shade cruise through the middle of the day, start hiking later. Well, that may work, it may not. There's a lot of, uh, uh, you're exposed in a lot of places in Southern California where you're the tallest thing around outside of a cactus here and there and, and maybe a Joshua tree, which isn't a tree, it's a giant cactus. But anyway, what I'm getting at is, and back to logistically, it's easier because all your trailheads are open, all your resorts are open, so you can cruise out and get food, you can get boxes you mailed yourself. Um, you can predict your speed. It's usually on dry trail. That makes it logistically easier to access resupplies and know, know what you're capable of doing. The, one of the pros of starting late is there's less snow. It's like, duh, you know, um, it's had more time to melt off. If we're talking a, a, after a normal winter with a, a thaw starting the end of May, the first of June, by the time you guys get there, which is typically four to six weeks after starting from Mexico, uh, puts you mid-June at Kennedy Meadows, back to Ray Day again, June 15th. That could be two weeks into the thaw. It takes about, once the thaw starts, so let me define that while we're here. The thaw technically starts when your overnight temperatures are no longer at or below freezing, and it is sustained thereafter. So if, for example, you happen to carry with you a um, what's called a kestrel or some other kind of uh, instrument that records overnight temperatures, um, when this thing tells you in the morning that it didn't get below 28 or 30, and then the next couple of days it's now 32, and the next couple of days it's now 34, the trend, you see where the trend is going, the thaw is on. And then you'll start seeing in about five days, depending upon the intensity of the sun, the amount of cloud cover, the amount of wind, the ambient temperature, et cetera, during the day, um, you'll start seeing creeks rise at trail elevation. Average trail elevation in my head, I, I consider to be about 11.2. Those of you who are more statisticians than I am, I stand, I could stand corrected, but in my head, that's kind of where I call it. And it, at trail elevation, um, you're certainly gonna have less snow, but um, that snow, which you do have, is gonna be softer. You're gonna have constant post tolling after the thaw starts. You're gonna have what's called sun cups. Sun cups start as, cute little depressions in the snow. Remember I talked about how the snow surface in the Sierra in, in the secret season in the month of May when things are still 10 degrees, 15 degrees at night. Uh, everything refreezes at night. So it's like a nice hard white sidewalk, easy to swing your feet and all that kind of junk during May. Now it's, it, it turns to soup about mid morning and you have to figure out how you're gonna get where you wanna go. 
uh, while you're wallowing in, in the stuff. But during the transition between secret season, we frozen what we call the freeze thaw cycle um, when it's still freezing at night. These little divots happen in the surface of the snow. I'm not exactly sure why. I used to think some bug got stuck in there. And because he was a different color and attracted heat or a pine cone or a pine needle or whatever, you know, then these little depressions start forming and they start just really shallow, like half the size of a cantaloupe. And, and then they just get bigger and deeper and bigger and deeper. And they'll actually turn into uh, something far different than what we call sun cups. They're more like sun garbage cans. And you definitely don't want to fall in one uh, because you can post hole in the bottom. So then you're at the bottom of a garbage can looking up like, help me, you know, kind of thing. So with a May start, with a mid-June entry, you're going to have more dry trail. You're going to have less snow, but the snow you have is going to be miserable. And I'll talk about how to deal with that tomorrow morning. Um, another advantage to starting late when it comes to snow is that a lot of people have already gone ahead of you. They've already established what I call a boot track in the snow. It's not my term. The term's been around for a long time, but it's when a whole bunch of, you know, when the herd moves ahead and they all want to stick to the trail and they feel like they're lost if they're not on top of it. And how do they know they're on top of it when they can't see it? That's where the GPS comes out and they can see where they are relative to the trail. If your GPS has a screen that you can see a topo map on. So those of you who may have attended the earlier uh, meetings regarding March and April starts, I advocated that you guys carry the Garmin InReach Explorer Plus with the with a bigger screen. And if I could have found it tonight, I'd have it. But you all probably seen the pictures, you know, the big screen shows you a little dot where you are. And it shows the dotted line on the, of the top of the map showing where the trail is. And you can say, OK, I'm a little above or a little below or whatever. And if you're if you're got to be exactly on top of it, which actually can be dangerous, depending upon the, the steepness of the slope, um, you can go to it and walk on the trail. And that's what most people do who are insecure about walking on snow. They figure they've got to be on the trail or they're lost. Whereas wherever you see switchbacks, and I know, Carol, I'm, I wanted to stick to bullet points. I really wanted to just keep it nice and simple, but I can't do it. So you're getting a little bit of uh, my enthusiasm here. Um, when you see, when you look at your topo map, say the night before, and you're having your dinner, and I always cook in my tent, that's just my thing. Uh, of course, when you cook in your tent, make sure you cook under the highest point of the roof line, your windows are open and all that kind of jazz. You know, want air circulation. Uh, anyway, you're, you're having dinner, you're looking at your map of the next day. Wherever you see switchbacks going up or down, pay attention because if there's switchbacks up, that's an opportunity to remember you're on snow. You can sh now shortcut switchbacks. You can go anywhere you want to go. If you feel like going straight up the hill from Rock Creek up into the upper bowls and heading toward Crabtree, go ahead. The nice thing about hiking on snow when it's nice and hard and easy to, to support your weight is that you can make beelines to things. And when you're in the high Sierra, you're largely at or above timber line meaning everything above you doesn't, there's no trees above you, but the trees are all below you, translating to, I can see the pass five miles ahead. From the pass, I can see the next pass 15 miles ahead. You have such incredible views in the Sierra, they'll blow your mind. Snow only adds to the fun of having this big white blanket and all that stuff. Uh, your camera and your pictures will love it. Anyway, so that was, that's a pro. More dry trail, less snow, boot track because people have gone before you. So if you're not so great at navigating, all you got to do is walk in their footsteps. Uh, keep in mind that footsteps compress snow. Uh, duh, I knew that, Ned. But in the process of compressing the snow, they heat the snow. And if, the ch if there's a chance, two things can happen. When you compress the snow, you harden it. If it has a chance to refreeze during the night, then it may hold your body weight. It may not. So even if you're walking on a boot track and it's holding your weight because it's between five, four in the morning and say nine in the morning, um, you're, you're golden. But after it starts softening, when the surface of the snow starts getting about two inches or three inches of slush and you've been feeling the sun beating on you for the last few hours, I would start 
are walking a little more nimbly because you can start post holing in the boot track. The boot track is not a nice flat. It, well, it is it is side to side, and that's what makes it advantageous because you can now wear micro spikes instead of hiking crampons. But um, it has its ups and downs. And when people are post holing in it, then it's full of these pit mines of people's footprints. And sometimes it turns into this honeycomb mess where you've got to be really careful how you um, uh, how you how you stand on it. And then if if it's softening, then it, it will encourage a post hole and sudden post holes on steep snow, whether that there is a boot track across it or not can throw your balance off and you can fall. Fall. I know I'm giving you a lot of stuff and it's not necessarily in the best order, but just kind of try and remember that a boot track is gonna be flat side to side. When it's flat side to side, you can stand on it vertically. If it's not because new snow has fallen on it, your body is always gonna to wanna to be vertical, but your feet, when it's sloped, your feet are going to want to, I'll steal this and I'll steal this. Let's say this is the slope. This is your brain on direct. No, we're not going there. Um, when the slope is at an angle, your feet want to be flat on it. That's going to drive your ankles crazy. and You're going to need to want to stand vertically. Therefore, you're standing on this slope, which is obviously is not flat like it was before when there was a boot track here, but now you're standing on the slope at the, at the grace of the, the edge of your soul. This is the thing that's saving your life. It isn't the micro spikes that are underneath. They may be hanging out in the air. For example, look, let's make this realistic, about a 35 degree slope, boot is plumb, sole is flat, Microspikes probably wouldn't even be touching if this was frozen. So you would be walking a little bit like this, if not completely like this. So your microspikes would get a grip. And what happens then is if it's sufficiently steep or you've stepped too aggressively, you can slide right out of your microspikes. And the next thing you know, you have no traction whatsoever and down you go. But anyway, I digressed here. Let's get back to finishing the snow aspect of the pros because there's less of it. Uh, oh, no, that would be a con, but I didn't write it down. Um, well, hopefully I'll remember. The other advantage, the other pros of, of May has to do with weight. You guys I know are very conscious about weight and that's wonderful when your body is like, what the hell are you doing? We're leaving compo and I've never done this and we've been training in the gym and it's nothing like walking with a, a pack on where I'm dodging rocks and roots and, and, and logs and things. And, and your ankles are going to scream at you, your knees are going to scream at you for like the first week or 10 days. So you want to start as light as possible. Starting late allows that. Starting early, where you may have snow as early as Mount Laguna, you've got to carry more clothes, maybe some technical gear, maybe a whippet. Well, you don't carry the whippet, it's in your hand. And there's another fallacy. Do I want to get into it? Okay, let's just try it. Whippet. Whip it is on a pole, right? One is two sections with a clamp. The carbon version, I think this year, has two clamps. It also breaks down into a Z shape with a bungee cord in it. The more sections, the more breakdowns of any pole makes it weaker. I don't care how the manufacturers want to push the product to sell it. Come on, that's, that's science. Uh, so you want a pole with a large diameter. This guy actually is pretty fat. I don't have a way, oh, maybe I do. This other thing that I've been playing with, you guys may have been wondering what the heck this is. You see, this is a tube. See if I can get that to disappear. Eh, I can't, <laughs> that's okay. This is a short tube. If any of you guys know what this thing is, I'd be surprised because you don't see them commonly anymore, but I don't think I can do this, so I'm not going to bother. This is an emergency splint for your tent poles should they break, and they do in wind events. So this would be the size of a fat tent pole, and you might be able to notice there's just a little bit of a difference in diameter. So this, this, this pole, the Whippet, two-section aluminum version, get aluminum, not carbon, is a much bigger diameter.
diameter than even your tent pole. And this is, a, I think this is fatter than a tent pole because it has to fit over the broken tent pole to, to, to make it uh, uh, repaired. And then you've got the, the uh, pick handle complex, which on this one, which is an older model, is non-removable. Once again, you don't want to have anything that's removable because it makes it a weak link. Um, I try to explain that to my students by saying, okay, you're self-arresting and you're going down the hill, uh, head up on your stomach, you're sliding toward your feet, you're going down the hill and you're, you've got the, the, the pick, this much of it, which is, which is about four, three, four inches, not as much as an ice axe, for example. So there you see, but what they did on the whippet is they added the metal wing. It's called a canard wing, probably after the guy at, at Black Diamond who, who thought of this, but it catches more resistance in the snow. So I don't have the length of the pick like I would on an ice axe, but I've got sufficient resistance because of the wing to slow me down. Now, what happens if you're sliding down the hill? Boy, am I digressing. Oh, well, this is all good. You're sliding down the hill and because three or four inches of the pick is going into the snowpack, what if it hits a, a big ice block? Say, say an avalanche happened in that vicinity, because once again, you fell, so you're on a steep slope. An avalanche happened there earlier in the winter, and what avalanches do is they throw chunks of snow everywhere. So your pick hits that block of, of ice. So the pick then gets ripped right out of your hand. Or it hits a tree branch because there's a tree buried under there and you didn't know it. Or it hits a broken off tree branch that got broken off by an avalanche earlier in the season. And it's just sitting right below the surface end. Or maybe you hit a boulder or a rock because you've only got um, maybe two, three, four feet of snow under you. And the boulders in that area, which you didn't know, but they're that big, just below the surface. So what happens is this gets ripped out of your hand. It will happen with either either tool, but the nice thing about the, the whippet is that in this case, it's one piece. The top may not, won't break off. It's all one piece. This is just one L-shaped piece all the way to the clamp. So all the way down, it's one piece. That's just like your ice axe. Hey, what do you know? They design it for that reason. Last thing you want to do is trust your life to something that's made up of little bits and pieces, supposedly clamped together or screwed together or whatever. I mean, how many of us have run across some screw that self backed itself out of some hole and we wonder, how did it do that? You know, like on a, on a, a deck outside your house or, or maybe uh, some cabinet because of vibration, the screws just back up. I sure hate to find out someday that the little thread thing on the whippet, the new ones that have the removable pick because it's more marketable. Yay, I can turn it into a summer hiking pole. I don't want a summer hiking pole. I want a reliable self-arrest device. Does it bother me to have this thing in my hand? No. Oh, it's a little heavier than a regular pole? Yes. Will my muscles get stronger? Yes. Will it become a problem? No. Will I carve myself up with these teeth? which are there. One of the things you learn to do is remember where that sucker's pointed and get used to it. And you train yourself and it all works out as this happy medium. Also, oh God, I didn't expect to go into this, but this is all good. So, so when you're hiking in the summer, people hold their poles like this. When you're on snow, if you're skiing, sure, because your poles are next to your body. You're, you're doing this kind of thing, like you would if you were summer hiking. But when you're walking up a steep hill, you should not be on snow holding on like this. Use everything you've got to get the hell up the hill. So what you're going to do is you're going to turn it around and you're going to palm the top like that. And you're going to plant your poles behind your body and you're going to push off the top of the pole to push yourself forward. Oh, and look, I've got this big flat platform up there to put the palm of my hand on so that it's nice and comfortable to do just that. Hey, it works great. Oh, 
downhill, what do you do with your poles downhill? You're once again, palming the top of the pole, but placing it this time out in front of you. So they work as brakes. Use your poles in every advantage possible. If you're on a steep hillside, let's bring this back in, and you're standing, bring the props out, you're standing like this on the hillside, where are your poles? They better as hell not be right next to your feet. They better not be here because you're using your poles for stability on snow, so you don't lose your balance and go head first down the hill. So your downhill pole, which is the whippet, should be placed next to your foot, but down a ways so that you can push off the top of it because you're palming the top to push your head toward the hill. If you should slip, that becomes your first method of making sure you land on your butt in the hill rather than on your head down the hill because you have your pole next to your side, say at the, what that would be, nine o'clock position, uphill is to your three o'clock, like I've got this and like I'm facing, which is kind of confusing because you see the opposite, maybe, maybe. But anyway, whippets in the downhill hand, this should be out at nine o'clock, a little ways away from your body. Where's your other pole? Not next to your foot again. It should be slightly ahead, more like at two o'clock and away from your body again. So you want to make that large triangle of pole placement and foot placement so that you have a good grasp of a sense of balance. Should you suddenly post hole, should you suddenly slip on something, or trip on that boulder you didn't see coming. Oh, and another thing, another hazard out there, realize that radiation from the sun travels through snow. It's not like it just melts the snow from the top down. It's gonna travel into the snow and hit anything of a darker color, denser body, like a rock, a tree, a leaf, pine branch, whatever, and it's gonna be absorbed there. So therefore anything that's of that nature inside the snowpack is gonna get hot sooner than the snow around it. So imagine a boulder in the snowpack. What's gonna happen with that? An airspace, as the boulder melts the snow that's touching it, naturally during the winter, but in the spring, the boulder will get hot two, three feet, no, two feet below the surface. It will get, I shouldn't say hot, it'll get warmer and it'll start melting the snow. So from the edge, Let's just say this is a let's say you're say this is a boulder in the snow. So from the edge of the boulder out about four inches, three inches is pretty common. Sometimes six inches out will be airspace because the heat from the rock has melted the snow. Snow loves to absorb water. So a lot of times it'll simply be reabsorbed into the pack and not like run down the snow pack. They could do that too. Um, but what I'm getting at is, as you're walking along, if you see the top of a boulder sticking through the snow, stay away from it, because there's an air pocket on the sides that when you plunge into and your leg scrapes along the side of the granite and you pull your leg out bleeding and gnarly looking, now you'll know why I told you that. You, you go way around obvious boulders. Uh, when the snow starts melting like mad, you'll start seeing where these boulders are. You can't see them yet because they're still melting, but you'll be able to tell where they're at. They're little humps in the snow. If you suspect it to be a boulder, either step directly on top and then take a big step off or go around it to avoid those, those voids, those air pockets. All right, so the pros were it's easier to navigate. It's logistically um, uh, simpler. Uh, there's less snow, more dry trail. You have a boot track and you can travel lighter.